Good morning and welcome. So I want to talk to you today about transparency. Transparency is one of those sort of obsession topics right now. People have a lot of different opinions about what they feel about transparency. And there's a lot of people in this room that are fighting the good fight. They're trying to get us to a point where we have access to information, government information. And we see it as part of the puzzle, right? Data becomes a really important part. And the reason why, of course, is that we want to empower people. We want informed citizens, and we hoped that by giving them access to data, we will create that. And I know that some of these people are doing amazing things, and I will, first I want to say thank you to everyone who's working in this space. But I also want to argue that transparency is not enough, and that one of the challenges we face with, uh, with issues of data is actually to complicate it. Not to actually complicate it in a way that's to dismiss it, but to think about how to, th how to work through some of the challenges. It's easy to sort of go to extremes, right? We must have transparent data, or we must get rid of uh, all of this data and make it, I make it obscure. That's not actually the right picture. We have to think about through the consequences of what happens when data is made transparent, who are all of the actors, and how do we actually get people to a point where they are informed in what's going on. I actually want to start by thinking about a specific case, a case where through a set of laws we actually made information transparent, and it reveals some of the complications that we have to pay attention to. I'm going to work on a concrete example, and it has to do about with Megan's Law. In 1994, a seven-year-old girl named Megan Kanka was raped and murdered in New Jersey by a child molester in her own neighborhood. In 1996, the US Congress amended the Crimes Against Children Act, requiring every state to develop procedures to notify the public when a sex offense. Ooh, I'm being paused. Is that any better? All right, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, the uh, Crimes Against Children Act was modified so that when a sex offender was released into the community, the public would be notified. The, these laws and the category of laws around them are referred to as Megan's Law. Most states have processes in place where se uh, sex offenders are required to notify when they've changed their location, their job, uh, and to make themselves known. Most states, states put this information available, um, but some have broader registries beyond it. So, because of Megan's Law, lists of registered sex offenders are made publicly available for the good of the community. Now, these lists have been available long before the internet, but the internet has radically changed it, making it a lot easier for people to actually get access to this information, to make decisions about what goes on in their community. And most people genuinely believe that the registered sex offender list is to the benefit of people in their community. And arguably, I should too. But actually, it's a much more complicated picture for me. Now, part of why is I actually have a lot of experiences with this personally. Shortly before I was born, a distant cousin of mine, who was the same age as Megan, was actually raped and murdered by one of our neighbors. Right? And I got to actually experience what this was like. And I've spent my life trying to fight against violence against women and girls to try to find a way to actually deal with this. And so I've been paying attention to the registered sex offender list and seeing all of the possibilities of it and all of the complications. And part of the complications go from the point that transparency is the number one driving goal, but that the reality of it is we have a much more complicated picture when we think about interpretation. In August, The Economist ran a series of articles on the unjust and ineffective nature of the American sex laws. They began with the expose with a story of Wendy Whitaker, who was arrested in 1996 at the age of 17 for having oral sex with a classmate three weeks before uh, his 16th birthday. She was convicted of sodomy against a minor, ended up in jail for a year, and is now listed on the registry. She sees people whispering, parents pulling their children uh, indoors when she walks by. Not only did she have to pay the price for her teenage indiscretions by going to jail, she's now forced to deal with it day in and day out because of the challenges of the registry. Now, I wish I would say that Wendy's case was, was rare, but one of the things that I found working in this space is that it's not, and that more and more kids are actually, or more and more people are starting to appear on the registry in really odd ways. The Sex Offender Registry now contains over 700,000 people. They're on that list for a variety of different crimes. Some of them are indeed a risk to community, the exact things that we imagine when we think about the registry. But there are plenty of people who aren't what you would necessarily expect. There are teenagers who are convicted of sexual crimes, uh, but often things like statutory rape for having sex with their uh, significant other who's underage because they're both in high school together. More and more, there are kids getting convicted of sexting. Kids can get convicted of child pornography creation and distribution because they think it's really funny to take a sexy picture. 
And before you sit there and say, ah, this isn't you know, my kids, keep in mind that 15% of kids have now received an image that can be construed as child pornography. That means that they've become possessors of child pornography. This picture is extremely messy, and the issue isn't with the registry itself, but the challenges of how people actually interpret the registry. How the registry gets out there into the public when we make this material transparent for the good of society. We want these, this information to be out there. We want parents to be able to make informed decisions. But we also need to give them the tools to interpret what they see. Now, most of you in your head, you have an image of a sex offender as evil incarnate. But the challenge is when we put a scarlet letter on them for the rest of their lives, we need to make sure we know what we're doing and how we're thinking about this. And we need to think about why this information was released in the first place. Now, we all love data, but we're also terrible at interpreting it. Ironically, we even love reading books that tell us we're in terrible at interpreting it. Over six million people have bought Freakonomics or Blink, um, which tell them that they're a terrible interpreter of information. And unfortunately, what I've learned by watching issues around sex crimes against minors is that politicians actually also are terrible at interpreting data and do a terrible job of communicating to the public what's going on. And the worst part is when we actually engage in a process where we misinterpret information and proliferate that. This goes back to actually one of the reasons we want this data available. We want multiple interpretations so that we can actually make certain that we're all in agreement. But it becomes a real challenge when the data that's put out there gets misinterpreted. Consider, for example, the statistic in two, from 2006 that one in seven minors are sexually solicited online. This is a number that I see flying around DC. It's employed by the attorneys general of the US to argue that the internet is dangerous for children. This statistic was from a highly reputable source the Crimes Against Children Research Center out of the UNH. The problem is actually not the statistic. It is a completely accurate statistic. It's about what it implies and how people misinterpret it. Most people assume that the statistic suggests that one in seven minors are sexually solicited from adults, sketchy old adults, that meet minors offline and engage in sex acts with them. Yet over 90% of sexual solicitations are from other minors or young adults. 69% right? of solicitations involve no attempt whatsoever at offline contact. And finally, the word sexual solicitation actually means anything from flirtation to sexual harassment. So when we see these numbers and when we use them as politicians and as a public, we have to really be careful with what we're actually saying. And part of it is we've used this information to actually generate fear. Now, as a co-director of the Berkman Center's Internet Safety Technical Task Force, I made a mistake in assuming that it would, be, it would be helpful to politicians to start communicating what this data actually meant. I went through the process of actually analyzing over 400 studies along with Andrew Schrock, analyzing all of the national sample data on sexual solicitation, on anything related to these issues. And it was amazing, the data is really consistent. We actually see a consistent picture of what's going on. So I documented it all up, and I proudly produced this literature review that I turned over to the attorneys general. What, I, what followed was not what I expected. I received a very nice phone call from a specific state attorney general who told me that I had to go find different data. And I was like, hmm, that wasn't quite what I was expecting. And when I stood my ground, I said, actually, no, all of this data is really consistent. We see it across a ton of different studies. He spent the next two months destroying me in the press. Right? This is what happens when we're fighting over data. Data is going to be something we will fight over over and over again. And it becomes critical that we engage in the challenges of data. Information is power. This is precisely why we want information to get into the hands of more people. But as we do this, we need to actually account for a new twist in all of this. Spinning information is also power. And what we will see more and more is as information gets out, people will start to engage in new forms of spin. They will control the interpretation of what information gets out there. Right now, that interpretation is very much in the hands of a lot of government officials. And it's one of the things we want to challenge. But we need to account for all of the ways in which different actors will try to engage in a power struggle to interpret information. And for this reason, transparency writ large is not enough. We need to spread information wildly, but we also need to give people the tools to actually be a part of the interpretation process. Keep in mind that you know, access alone will not empower people. Information alone will not empower people. It can be manipulated to disempower people, specifically when it's used as a tool of fear or when it's used as a tool to keep um, managing to say certain things about certain groups of people. 
Data like the sex offender, sex offender registry is meant to do both. It's meant to help people stay afraid, and it's meant to encourage a certain kind of hate, uh, hateful feelings towards other citizens. This becomes dangerous, and we need to really think through how we not just make this data available, but we, how we help people go through this process. Information is also not neutral. Neutrality is a great idea, but Wikipedia entries are not neutral, nor, is, nor are algorithms that produce you know, neutral news, nor for that matter is any news anchor, regardless of whether or not they're fair and balanced. Even when people try their darndest to keep a straight face, news anchors give away their biases. And we all do. We all interpret things and we tell the stories that we want to see. Biases don't get canceled out by having more people fighting from different sides. In fact, that pushes people to extremes. And this is one of the things that we keep seeing with data. People go to extremes. We need to think about through the interpretations and the ways in between it all. Now, it's easy to misinterpret what I'm saying. Transparency is good. I keep saying that transparency is important, but we have to go beyond it. Information is power, but interpretation is more powerful. Data taken out of context can have all sorts of unintended consequences, and so we have to think about how data presented out of harm can be used to create certain kinds of harm. Transparency alone is not a great, the great equalizer, and we need to actually go beyond that. So keep in mind that the number one goal of transparency is to empower people, to give them opportunities to be informed citizens, to allow people to be a check to power. But when power releases data, one of the challenges is how they're going to maintain power by controlling the spin. And it's one of the things that those of us who are involved in the processes of making data available need to actually engage with the challenges of, those, of how it will be interpreted. We must also help people develop the skills to interpret this. This is not as easy as it sounds. There's a reason why people become experts at interpreting information, doctors, for example. We need to give people the skills with which they can get access to information and make sense of it. This is actually, as a member of the Knight Commission, I spent a lot of time trying to think through these challenges. One of the first things we realized, and, and one of the things I stand by, maximizing the availability and uh, relevant and credible information is absolutely essential. But so is enhancing the information capacity of individuals. This is absolutely critical to actually achieve the first goal itself. Information alone will not actually get us to the interpretations. So to capitalize on information transparency, we need information literacy. This means media literacy and digital literacy. It includes the skills to interpret information in a context. And it's not something that people just develop because they have access to information. So assuming that we can actually deal with these information literacy questions after we deal with transparency is naive. It's also important to realize that skills around information uh, literacy are not evenly distributed at the moment. And that becomes a real challenge for all of us. Esther Hargitay has consistently shown that those who are most privileged in our society have the best skills for interpreting the information we put out there. This creates a challenge if we want to think about equality, because we have to think about who we're disempowering in the process, simply because we assume that everybody has information skills. They don't. Right? And we need to actually go through a process of education, a process of public communication, a process of, of getting people to buy in, to develop these skills and understand what's going on. It's a lot like what we think about in terms of broadband and digital, the digital divide. Right? Providing broadband access is, is fantastic, but it doesn't actually guarantee a certain kind of digital literacy just because people can get there. The same is true for information. Providing the information is not alone. It's absolutely essential first step, but it has to come uh, at the same time as information literacy. So when, we're, when we rally for information transparency, all of those who are, of you who are fighting for it, I need you to start engaging in these issues. I need you to think about how data can be manipulated, and I need you to help make certain that we ward that off. All of the different actors who might engage in this manipulation, and all the ways in which we might be misinterpreted. And finally, this is a country built on the notion that we are all created equal. Those of us working towards transparency need to push towards these challenges, need to push towards information literacy. The internet radically increases opportunities for information to be made available, and that's what we're celebrating here. But it doesn't magically give people the opportunity. I ask you to start fighting for it. Thank you.